Welcome to the Papre.com where we are on the segment of the DFCC Know and Grow where we are introducing a legend to you of uh, Sri Lanka rugby football, a gentleman who has contributed as much off the field as he has on the field, Mr. C. Chang Yu or YC Chang as he is also known as YC to his friends. Uh, hello YC, welcome to the show, good to have you on board. Thank you very much, Shanika. It's um, been a wonderful uh, career that you've had on the field, a wonderful career as an administrator off the field. Looking back at uh, all these years in rugby, I see what is your most uh, aspiring memory? It's a, it was an ongoing thing, I think, from one step to another. Mm -hmm. Starting from my school, uh, leaving at an early age, because I found the playing field not level, came down to Colombo, and then next thing I knew, uh, I'm playing rugby for Hablock Sports Club. It's a very interesting story actually, the fact that you made it to the national side without actually representing Trinity at first 15 level. Can you tell us a bit about that? That, that was more determination in me to prove that the school had done wrong in me. So that made me keep going. Mm -hmm. My uh, fitness levels were the highest at that point of time, I was never tired. And uh, that was what uh, got the selectors, you know, picking me up uh, every time. And uh, from there onwards, and I got, I displaced quite a lot of uh, uh, Sri Lankan players from the Havelock side, and I was able to play in my first day itself. And then I was selected to play Barbarians. And in that in that era, it was all expats, and to get into a side like that, mm -hmm. it was quite an achievement. So you came down from uh, Kandy, you came to Colombo and started playing for Havelocks. You yeah. played for Havelocks for many years, then you uh, actually played for Kandy for a few years as well, yeah. and then uh, CH and FC as well. So is there a big cultural difference between these clubs, uh, YC? Um, I wouldn't say that. As I said, it is uh, a thing that, that evolved in me. Now, having uh, been told by my parents to become a doctor, it never happened. Hmm. Then you go on and you play Havelock rugby, then you are headhunted by a European and he says, right, are you interested in planting? I said, no sir, not yet. Well, if you are interested, just let me know. And next thing I knew, I, I played three years for Havelocks, of which were two cup years. We won the cup for the Havelocks. And then I go off planting and there I was doing very well. And uh, I played a year for Candy and then I was made captain again. Mm -hmm. And it, as I said, it was it all. I never planned my future as such in terms of uh, my employment. I was always handpicked for things, and my work was so good at the estate. Um, again, I was handpicked to come to Colombo and do, you know, tasting and blending. So, and actually, talking about uh, tea, you were also one of the few people who captained up country and low, low country. country. That's right. Yes, that, I, I was. that must have been a big experience for oh you at yes, that time. Oh, oh yes, I think uh, basically I don't think anybody else has done that. Yeah, and it was se severe perseverance, you see, uh, and I had the, uh, shall I say, the physical ability to do that. You know, when you have been told on one occasion by the coach, uh, Changi boy, I don't think you can play Sri Lanka if you don't come for practices every day. <laughs> Is that so? So I go back to the estate and I was walking along and I said, uh, my boss was very keen on my rugby and he said, what's happening? I said, sir, I don't think I'm going on this tour or anything like that. Why? I have to be for practices every day. So he walks with me for half an hour. He says, I, I really don't think that's a big problem for you. I said, why do you say that? So I was starting early in the morning at 6, you finish off by 12. So. You catch the gamble and train down to Colombo, you'll be there at 3.30, you go for practices at 4, you finish off, have your bath, catch the nightmare back to Gampola. And did you actually do that? I did that for two months. Wow. Okay. And they couldn't drop me. So you travelled every day from every Kandy to Colombo? And mark you, it's all on my salary that I came down, you know. We didn't have the professionalism mm -hmm. that is happening now. Well, that's a uh, know and grow lesson for you, certainly, in terms yeah. of perseverance. So, you actually did make the Sri Lanka squad. That would have been yeah. a very proud that's moment right. for oh, you. Oh, yeah. That is, that is one thing I always give myself credit to. I don't stop, I keep on going, you know. 
and did some eyebrows raise from your Trinity College mates when you actually made it with them? <laughs> I think they must have, they really didn't speak about it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you, you were handpicked, as you said, uh, for a lot of leadership roles as well, yeah. uh, YC. Not only on the field, you captain Havelocks, you captain Candy, you yeah. captain CH, but uh, off the field as well in the SLRFU, you were the president. And did these leadership roles come naturally to you? Yes, I never had to fight for it. Mm -hmm. It's just my, you know, the systematic hard work and perseverance that I got those things. And you were part of the uh, committee that spearheaded the development of rugby around Sri Lanka yes, yes. under the uh, presidency of... Uh, that was one of my, uh, shall I say, a foresight I had mm -hmm. for this uh, game. And we started small in the 90s and we found uh, the financials were very, very difficult and mostly the sponsors would have to be, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, people with uh, means to come mm -hmm. and help us. Mm -hmm. But at the end, I think eventually IRB came in, and that was the time young Priyante Kanayaka became the uh, president. And uh, we had a fair amount of money from them, where we started on a very, uh, quite a major scale. You know, every province was taken in, and we had 2,500 schools in each province. Mm -hmm. And we, our uh, input was only to get the development officers and the coaches to go to the schools and start the game going. Mm -hmm. And uh, during Priyanta's time, I think uh, we got all the provinces involved. We got the uh, Minister of Education, the Provincial Education uh, Ministries to agree that it is, a, it'll, it is, a, it is a national sport. And uh, it was worked on a, every district, uh, schools were playing each other, it was walking distance for them. Mm -hmm. And then they played uh, an apex top two, being the leaders where they would have played uh, interprovincial. But unfortunately, after Priyanta went off, subsequent presidents could uh, maintain that they had some other ideas in them. But had it been, uh, at that time, when the thing, minds changed, we had done 400 schools down south, that in the Gaul district. Mm -hmm. or Gaul. So, then Sabragama had another 400. North Central Province had another 400. Central Province had, I think, something like 200. Now, Mark, well, that's going up to 2,000 odd schools, but we had done that little bit. And had they gone right through with it, I think, Today, Sri Lanka players would not find royalist Sri Indians or any of them. <laughs> so you're obviously not as happy now as you were back 20 years ago when you started it. You think it should have developed no, a lot further? No, nowadays, I just inquired uh, from some of the provinces. There is no input whatsoever. Mm. They're just forgotten about development. It's unfortunate. When you played, you played against a lot, with and against a lot of expat, uh, expatriates who were yeah. working in the plantations and so forth. Um, how do you find that the game has changed since they've gone away? As I have always maintained, rugby is evolutionary. What we played during our time and what is being played now is a completely different concept. As usual, the more stronger, big bone people like you know New Zealand, Australia, the northern sector, they evolved this too uh, for their own benefits. Mm -hmm. Now in the 60s, our game was all a beautiful run and pass and it was really nice. It's a you know, symphony of moves, now people like Carmen Ramakrishna can you know, dazzle you with his side steps and all that. I mean it is, you don't see that today. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, then it slowly changed. In the 80s, we found the New Zealander, some Shelford or some guy, huge fellow, about 300 pounds. He takes the ball, thumps it in front, and then after that, it's dead. And then you know, it kept kept on going. It became really boring. In one of my articles as a journalist, I wrote this, mm -hmm. and I foresaw that this game is going to uh, not going to draw crowds, which now, in fact, is happening. In Sri Lanka, if you see the grandstands, hardly any players come to see club games. That is mainly because of this system of rugby that is... The physicality has taken yeah, away the yeah, entertainment. 
Exactly. So what I feel for us is to do a, a localized thing where we enjoy our game and get the spectators to come, help the clubs to revive financially, you know, play a run and pass game. I mean, we are entitled to do that. In 1983-84, when I decided uh, to make rugby professional, Mark, we, I, we are the first country to do that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, no other country had done it. IRB didn't do it. Mm. We had started and I had a big uh, correspondence with the uh, RFU then, Rugby Football Union, mm -hmm. that I can't do it. I said, why not? I said, I want to improve the game. No, you can't. I said, then you come and do our administration. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, as long as you keep it within your uh, peripheral areas of Sri Lanka, we mm -hmm. will allow you. That's how we started. Well, those days the grandstands were overflowing <coughs> when uh, Hablocks and CR and CH played each other and even Candy. And uh, now, of course, you see that the club uh, game is dwindling, the crowds are completely dwindling. Uh, wh what happened, uh, YC, and how do we fix it? Well, I told you, you know, we are aping <laughs> greater countries who play rugby like New Zealand, Australia. They still haven't changed except for France. They started in the recent years to start moving the ball, mm -hmm. and it did it did have a, a change. But still, with this great mass of weight behind them, they you know they can kill you by going from one 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 place uh, ten yards more they drop again, another ten yards more they drop again. You and it is so boring to watch it. Actually, I don't watch these games now. That is what happened. How are we going to change it? How are we going to reach? Uh, international standards. I don't think we are going to. I always profess that it won't happen. Every yard we take, the other guys are gone at least 10 yards ahead, you see. Physically, we can't. It's impossible. You see. So we have to evolve again that Sri Lankans like. And then go and send these boys on a nice tour, let them enjoy themselves and come back. That was all what I had in mind those days. Send the team. I used to take the teams out just for the fun of it see the countries and come back, you know. And uh, you coached as well, you coached this yes. and uh, you Patana, would have brought that philosophy into uh, your coaching as well. Coaching, I did, uh, uh, professional was in uh, uh, coaching the CHNFC. I really enjoyed it because the players there were very well focused on their fitness and things like that. I had a fa fantastic team, I had people like Chan Chan Pereira, uh, in the back row I had Saman Jai Singh, uh, what a lot of fanatics, fitness fanatics mm. they were. They come in at three o'clock. I didn't have to push them. And I didn't have to tell them much either. Mm -hmm. you, you had to. That professionalism has gone a little bit, even no. though it wasn't professional no. back then. No. Now you don't get it. It's very difficult to get the guys to come for practice even at six o'clock now. Even after paying them. And uh, what do you think that's down to? <laughs> <laughs> too many distractions for uh, the players or too much I, going on? I really don't know. I don't want to uh, point the finger at the young players. Well, they are getting a lot of money out of this game. But I do not know why they can't. They, physically, uh, physically, they cannot match the international people. Maybe the servants, they are doing a little bit better because you are really running the ball around. Mm. You don't get physical in the servants. But in the 50s, there is no way. We think can enjoy the game here, get the public to come and support you, you see. And uh, what can you say about uh, rugby in general impacting your life, uh, YC? You said you got your first job through it and yeah. you've enjoyed uh, travelling the country. Actually, it. actually, it is a discipline. Uh, I found it, I achieved most of my, uh, mo most of what I wanted to do in life. Uh, because of my rugby, the discipline I had. Otherwise, I would have not achieved uh, what I had to do my own business. And from there, you know, go on. So in my 75th year, I'm quite content. <laughs> That's <laughs> three quarters of a century. What are, what are your words of advice in parting to the younger players who are looking to know and grow yeah. from this? Enjoy yourself, enjoy the game. Uh, and work hard in whatever sphere you are doing, you know. And you'll get, get there. Well, uh, you're learning and knowing and growing on the DFCC from one of the legends of the Sri Lankan game, Mr. Y.C. Chang. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Thanks, Shadagan.